Okay, everyone, good morning or good evening from wherever you are in the world. My name is Laura LeBurr and I'm a marine science educator here at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our first edition of Career Dives, Conversations in Marine Science. This summer series will highlight the career tracks, interests, and projects of eight marine science professionals working with the Smithsonian Marine Station and the Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. While people are joining, please feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen and let us know where you're joining from. Hello, Canada. Hi, Florida. Oh, hello, Ireland. Wow, we've got lots of really great attendees today. Awesome, well welcome everyone. As everyone joins the webinar, I'd like to point out just a few of the features. You can use the Q&A box to ask your questions to our scientists. Um, they are down at the bottom, there are the two speech bubbles. You can submit a question at any time and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible. Please be patient with us. There's a lot of questions, I'm sure, and we may not be able to get to all of them, but we do have another educator helping us get through them. Throughout the program, you can also use the chat box to send us messages and answer any questions we may have for you. Your comments are visible only to Smithsonian staff, so please keep them on topic and appropriate. Today's program is going to be about 40 minutes, and if everyone's ready, let's get started. So, I'm really excited to introduce our guest scientist for today, Dr. Valerie Paul. She's the director and head scientist for the Smithsonian Marine Station. Dr. Paul has an extensive career and serves both as a scientist and administrator at the Marine Station. Dr. Paul, let's dive, although we're gonna dive into it further in the program, could you briefly share with us your research focus? Yeah, good morning everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so I'm a marine biologist. I have got my PhD in marine biology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I study, uh, uh, do a lot of work on coral reefs, but I also study harmful algal blooms. I look at uh, some, of the, uh, some of the chemicals, the compounds that these organisms make and how they use them uh, in the environment, for instance, for chemical protection or chemical defense. And I'll show you some, share some slides with you about that in a little bit. Awesome, I suspect that you've had many experiences and adventures before becoming the head scientist at the Marine Station. So if you don't mind, let's go back to the beginning of your career. How did you get interested in marine science? And were you always curious about the ocean? So let me share a few slides with you. Um, let's see if you, can you guys, let's see if I think I have to hit screen share. Hang on one second. Um, and I can do that. Can everybody see the first slide takes us back in time a little bit. Uh, so I, I think it's fair to say I've always been interested in science, uh, even as a very uh, young person, like in uh, fourth, you know, third and fourth grade, I had a really strong interest in science and could always imagine myself, uh, you know, being a scientist later in life. But it wasn't until I went to the University of California at San Diego, uh, which is in La Jolla, it's just in the northern part of San Diego, uh, that I really got interested in the ocean. And I got really involved with the um, dive program there. They had a really strong scuba diving program where they had classes and re uh, research activities in the ocean. And I got really uh, captivated by that and by the diving. And uh, in particular, and for any of you that are undergraduates or high school students and are thinking uh, at all about science, uh, I encourage you to try some research opportunities as a student because that's what really, really uh, made the difference for me. And I was doing, as part of the diving program, we were doing some research on the California spiny lobster shown here on the right. And then um, I also got involved in a project down at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography on this uh, little uh, sea slug, this animal on the left. It's um, so the pistobranch, so um, we com commonly call them sea slugs, but it's called Navinax enormous. And uh, it, it's a pretty big uh, uh, animal for a sea slug. It's probably um, 10 centimeters long, so you know five inches or so. 
And they're really fascinating because they follow one another's slime trail. They're also very predatory, so they'll eat other slugs and snails. Uh, and I was working with a researcher down at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is part of the U University of California San Diego campus, but sort of uh, down the down the hill on the on the ocean. And uh, we started working on this animal and found that it produced these compounds that. Uh, were, were defensive in nature and also uh, made one animal stop following the trail of another. So we call them alarm pheromones. And this was what really uh, gelled for me. And you can, for those of you who might have any interest in chemistry, you can see the uh, structures of the compounds there. They're bright yellow compounds that this animal squirts out when it's been um, poked or prodded or possibly bitten by a fish or something. Uh, and so they, uh, some, the, they're using these compounds for protection. And this just was so fascinating to me to think about how um, in the ocean, these chemicals, these different kinds of compounds that organisms produce can have a really important role in the ecology and the behavior of these animals. So I really went on, uh, my advisor down at Scripps was uh, this uh, Professor Bill Fenical, sh shown here in a hammock at uh, Kiribo Key Field Station. I'll show you that a little bit later a little more, but um, he was really a great mentor. He's a, a chemist and I went on to get my PhD with him because it was just, uh, again, just so fascinating to me to, to follow this area of research. And I uh, studied these compounds in a green algae called, in a green algae called Halamida and other related green algae. Here you can see some pictures on them. They're really important in reef habitats. They're also calcified, so they uh, help with the uh, calcium carbonate sands and framework of the reef, but they produce these uh, compounds called terpenes that are also found in a lot of land plants. And we uh, studied those for their chemical defenses. And the ways we did that were to do really simple experiments, like put out on the reef these little uh, buffet lines, if you will, of different algae, and look at uh, fish that come along and eat the algae, uh, what we call herbivore or herbivorous fishes. They'll come along, they'll graze the algae, but it's just like us going to a buffet line. We take what we like, we leave what we don't like, and by studying that, we could tell a lot about the uh, fish feeding preferences. And for instance, the ones that were usually chemical defend chemically defended were often the ones they didn't eat, not surprisingly, right? If it tastes bad, you're not going to eat it. And so we could learn a lot about the algae just from these really, really simple experiments. And we could also take extracts of the algae and test those in these kinds of feeding assays on the reef as well and uh, see if the, um, if the organisms uh, were actually chemically defended. So there were a lot of different things we could do. And we really learned a lot about coral reef ecology. We learned how these different algae were protecting themselves from grazers, I'll show you some pictures of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae in a few minutes, and those are also doing very similar things. They're all uh, using chemical defenses, and, and a lot of land plants do this same sort of thing. So here's a picture. I got some really great experiences in grad school. We um, got to go out on some cruises through the Bahamas and collect these algae. I also got an opportunity to go down in Hydrolab, and this is my uh, good friend Mark Hay uh, peeking out the window of Hydro Lab uh, in a mission that we did in the mid 1980s. So that was a lot of fun and uh, really had a great uh, graduate school experience. Well, Dr. Paul, it looks like you had a lot of fun doing different kinds of field work and lots of interesting research. Um, do you have a significant role model or mentor throughout your path? I know you mentioned a few, but your career in marine science was starting at a time when women weren't very represented in the field. Could you talk about how things maybe changed over time for women in science? Uh, yeah, well, certainly women have, uh, have been, or increasingly um, involved in marine science. And in fact, in most graduate programs now, there are a lot more uh, women than, than men in many uh, marine biology programs or marine science programs in general. Uh, they still aren't uh, as well represented at the, uh, the in some of the leadership roles or at the higher uh, professorial ranks, but that's changing, fortunately. Uh, I mentioned my mentor, Bill Fenical, uh, obviously not a female role model, but certainly very supportive, and he's helped a lot of 
other female scientists, um, uh, many of whom are friends of mine, uh, also get involved in the field of uh, marine natural, what we call marine natural products chemistry, so studying those small compounds as well as uh, uh, chemical ecology. And I have a, a few more slides in the future, and I'll point out a few other important mentors and role models. But of course, for everyone, that's really important to have people that can uh, help you and help you even beyond uh, the period of time where you're interacting with them. For instance, uh, Bill Pinnacle, I've uh, kept in touch with to this day, and he still has written nice uh, letters of support for me and other things. So it's uh, very, very important to have um, good mentors in your career. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. So I think now we're going to transition to how you became a researcher here at the Smithsonian, but you did that by going to a very unique place. So would you like to share about your experience in Guam? Sure. So as uh, Laura just mentioned, I get back to the screen share. Am I on screen share, Laura? Or? having some trouble getting back to screen share. Well, while you're doing the screen share, we're going to go ahead and maybe take one or two questions just while we have a moment. Let me just pull those up. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions. So I think I'm back on. I think I'm back on screen. You are. Am I? Go right ahead. Yeah. So uh, as Laura mentioned, right after I finished my PhD, I uh, was uh, actually for part of my PhD research, I had gone out to the University of Guam Marine Laboratory to collect some of the green algae out there in the Pacific because most of my the rest of my work had been done in the Caribbean. I wanted to uh, expand that a little bit. And Guam, for uh, any of you don't, that don't know, is a U.S. territory, but it's way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, if you see my little uh, dot on the map here, uh, out closer to Japan than it is to the United States. And so it's got a very, um, it's very well known for its role with the U.S. military, for instance, out in the Pacific. But it's a tiny little island. It's only uh, about 20 six or 27 miles long from tip to tip. So uh, it's very small, but has a, a population like a small um, town or small city, about you know, 200,000 people. And this is the University of Guam. It sits up on a hilltop. And then you go, you wind your way down this kind of steep hill and here's the marine laboratory down on the water. So it's a really cool place to do marine science. I was able to spend a lot of time in the field. We had pretty good, I mean, it looks a little, um, uh, primitive, but we have pretty good uh, seawater system with lots of uh, ability to hold uh, marine organisms in tanks and do experiments with them. And also, of course, a lot of field access. I was able to work on more sea slugs, like this little tiny sea hare that eats um, algae, like that red al al alga that you see on the right there. And the, al the algae uh, produce chemicals, like I told you about, and the uh, sea hares can actually sequester those compounds and use them for their own protection. Another group of animals that some of you might be familiar with that are super, super cool, I think, are the nudibranchs. And here you see one on a sponge. This is the sponge that it eats. And sponges are also not only uh, algae, but sponges and other marine organisms on the reef, like soft corals, also produce chemical defenses to keep them protected, uh, especially if they're soft bodied like a sponge they would otherwise be eaten by all the predators on the reef. And so we could make little uh, fake sponge cubes um, and test how those compounds were de uh, deterrent and they're very strongly deterrent and these little sea hares can also sequester those compounds. So another important mentor of mine um, while I was in Guam was uh, not actually in Guam, but at the University of Hawaii. This is Paul Scheuer. 
and he's widely regarded as the founder, if you will, of uh, marine natural products chemistry. <clears throat> and uh, he was uh, really uh, very, very helpful to me working out in Guam, which was fairly remote. Uh, he really helped uh, facilitate a lot of my research. So he was another very important mentor. And I got to do some cool work with him. Let me just show you this one slide and I might have to talk you through it a little bit, but I was working with him as well as a, another researcher in Hawaii uh, named Michael Hadfield. And I actually spent about a year there on a sabbatical from the University of Guam working on this project. And it's got another sea slug in it, another uh, nudibranch called Pistilla sabogi. And this is what it looks like. It's really um, quite, quite pretty. Uh, it's about uh, centimeters long at the biggest. They're not very big, but here you see it <clears throat> grazing on its preferred food, this uh, coral called varieties. And that's, they can be in the, in nature, their populations don't get that high because they get eaten by fish and things. So they don't cause a lot of damage, but <clears throat> in aquaria, they're known to cause a lot of damage because they can eat a lot of the coral. So if you look at the picture on the right, what you see is the metamorphosis of this sea hair. And uh, I think everybody is familiar with metamorphosis in the sense of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, right? I mean, that is uh, a transition, a life history transition in that organism where the <coughs> larval stage looks very, very different from the adult stage. And we get the same thing here with this little nudibranch. So this is what a nudibranch larva looks like up on the top. It's called a villager. And over the course of 24 hours, if it's exposed to the water that this coral is held in, so the coral is releasing some kind of cue, we don't know what it is, and that's what we were trying to study, but we never exactly figured it out. Um, <clears throat> but we do know that the water could trigger this metamorphosis. So there's a chemical signal being released by the coral that um, causes the whole animal to change from a <laughs> excuse me, a larval form to a tiny little sea slug. So it's super cool. And there's another species of Pacilla that's really, really colorful and nice called Melanobranchia that lives on this orange cup coral. Here's a, here's a nudibranch. You can see how it almost perfectly blends in with the polyps of the coral. And this one does the same thing. It uses a cue from the cup coral to metamorphose. Sorry. I also started working on um, blue-green algae, especially some that can har cause these harmful blooms that we see in many places around the world. And an interesting little slug that can eat these algae, uh, and we were doing some feeding assays with that. You can see it in a little bowl there. So that's kind of my transition to Guam, and I spent 17 years out there. So it was a long time and we got to do a lot of research and really explore the coral reefs and a lot of these uh, chemical connections on the coral reefs like I talked to you about. Before we get into Smithsonian Marine Station, Val, we had a really good question from one of our audience. The question is, what was the most challenging part of your education that might be helpful for aspiring marine biologists to know in either your undergrad or graduate level research? Uh, well, you know, graduate school is challenging. Uh, I was lucky. I had a, a very uh, helpful mentor and a good laboratory group, but you have to be really committed. Uh, undergrad, of course, you get a very broad background. I found undergraduate very rewarding but I wanted to delve in deeper, and that's why I went to graduate school. But it's an intense experience for at least, most, most graduate programs are about at least four years long, but most are about five. It took me about five, which is probably about average. And uh, you really have to want to do research because that's what you're gonna be doing most of that time. You only take courses in maybe the first year or so. Um, and but for me, it was wonderful because I love doing research. And so it's definitely not for everyone, but uh, if you really find research fun and rewarding, it can be a great, a great opportunity. Awesome, thank you so much for answering that. So I guess without further ado, let's get right on into what brought you to the Smithsonian and if you could discuss your current work. 
Sure. So I joined the Smithsonian Marine Station in 2002. So I've now already been here uh, almost 18 years. And uh, what was, uh, let's see. So Guam, as you, got, as you saw from my map at the beginning, is a long way away from the mainland United States. And so my husband and I, uh, at that time, all had our family back here in the, in, on the mainland U United States. And we're just looking at a way to come back because our, uh, come back to, to the US because our parents were getting older and wanted to be closer to family and everything. Uh, and so I started looking around for job opportunities. I wasn't, I mean, I still enjoyed Guam, so I wasn't um, real, really set on leaving right away or anything. But I saw a job opening at the Smithsonian Institution, but specifically for directing the Marine Laboratory. And so that's, I applied and obviously uh, got the job after about a um, several months process of interviews and those sorts of things. And uh, so I came here in August of 2002. And so it's been a, a really uh, rewarding opportunity. I feel very lucky I've got to spend my entire career at marine laboratories uh, one, in one way or another. So um, they're very special places for anyone that's ever worked at one. You know that you can really um, delve into the to the science and do a lot of hands-on work with marine organisms. And that's what's always been really fun to me. And, and the access to the field. I mean, almost every marine laboratory has boats and um, some have very sophisticated research vessels. Uh, we have only smaller boats, but uh, you can really access the ocean. And uh, I'm also still a very avid diver. So I love, I love doing underwater work as well. Very cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we've got a couple more things to talk about for your current research. Okay. Uh, I think I'm still screen sharing, right? You can see yeah. that. So as part of the uh, job at the Smithsonian Marine Station at, in, in 2010, we also uh, took on the management of a tiny little field station down in Belize called the Kariboki Field Station. And we don't, the Smithsonian doesn't own this property, we lease it, but it is, uh, we basically have the whole island as our little field station. And here it is uh, pictured below there. And so we manage, uh, two, two of our staff here at the Marine Station help manage this field station. Um, unfortunately, it's currently closed because of the pandemic, but, and the travel restrictions, but uh, we'll hopefully be opening up again uh, in the future. And it's just an amazing place to do research because you, can, you have total, total escape. You can uh, do all kinds of cool research down there. And I wanna mention um, our former director at, at the Marine Station, uh, Dr. Mary Rice, who uh, studies worms. You can see her holding one, worms called cypunculins or uh, peanut worms. But uh, she's another uh, inspiration and mentor and she was the director here for 21 years before I took over as the station, but she's continued to uh, stay and work and has been uh, extraordinarily helpful to me over the years. And so, um, you know, another important mentor, <clears throat> and in this case, a, a female mentor, finally. So <laughs> here we go. Um, but I got here to Florida and started finding a lot of other uh, algal blooms on the reefs. These are off of uh, Fort Lauderdale area that were very uh, extensive in the 2000, uh, in the mid 2000 uh, time frame when I first got to Florida. Uh, we still see some of these uh, cyanobacteria, these are blue green algae on the reef, uh, but you can see how they're overgrowing other things like up here, um, where they're overgrowing another uh, soft coral. And uh, we've done feeding assays with these. Here's some blue green algae on the left, uh, overgrowing seagrass beds. And this happens right here every summer, right around the marine station. So we've done a lot of work with some of these algal blooms. Another uh, cyan cyanobacterial bloom that's uh, more coral reef focused is this one called black band disease. And I've been working on this with a number of colleagues over the years. We've been working on this disease for about six years. Uh, and this will kill coral. It can be found around the world. You can see this white skeleton at the top of the coral is dead, coral skeleton. 
and that's because that black band layer has killed it. Another coral that we are currently, uh, coral disease that unfortunately has become very prevalent in Florida and is now spreading around the Caribbean is this one called stony coral tissue loss disease. The white skeleton here again is dead. Uh, the coral has died, so it's this uh, nice golden colored uh, tissue that is the live coral. This one's quite sad because it's quite devastating and we're trying to look for some treatments and ways to better understand this disease. One of my uh, big areas over the last 15 years since coming to Florida has been to try to better understand uh, how we can help reefs recover. And by doing this, by studying the reproduction of the corals and how to bring new baby corals back onto the reef. And so we've done a lot of this work at Caribo. Here's another picture of the, um, of the field station with some underwater scenes in here as well. And we study the coral spawning. Uh, some of you have probably seen uh, pictures of coral spawning. Corals often do these mass spawning events once or twice a year. Uh, we've seen lots of pictures uh, you know, on nature shows and things of the Great Barrier Reef doing mass coral spawning. Um, that's very well known, but the Caribbean corals do this as well. And this is Elkhorn coral, Acropora palmata, and all those little pink, it's like almost like a snow globe when you're out there at, in, the, in the field with the, with the coral spawning. All of that are egg and sperm bundles that are being released by this one coral. And so on a reef where there's a lot of coral, it can really be quite amazing. And this is a, a great picture, I think, showing you all that coral spawn in the water. Um, they egg and sperm will fertilize in the water column and they take about four or five days, depending on the coral species, for them to turn into larvae. And then, uh, then they're ready to settle in metamorphose. And so we, we actually uh, rear them up in the laboratory. And here's, <clears throat> let me show you this picture. This is some, uh, a paper that we published on some of this work a few years ago, but on the left-hand side of your screen, you see, there's my cursor, uh, you see some of the larvae still, they're kind of elongated, uh, crawling around on the surface of coral and algae, Prestos coral and algae, which is this pink stuff growing the rocks, and this is what they like to settle on. Uh, and then here's what a new baby coral looks like. So it almost looks like a little, the, a little flower or something. So it transforms from this kind of elongated larval form called a planula to a new little polyp. And so that's a, a new, uh, new baby coral. And for them to then grow and become an adult coral, of course, takes a, a lot of time, years, and luck as well, because as you can imagine, they're very vulnerable at this early stage, so they can die pretty easily. One of the fun things, Laura, that, that we've been able to work on here in Florida is the um, right here in the Indian River Lagoon, which is right where the Marine Station is located. We're in Fort Pierce, so we're right about here on the map. And the, the Indian River Lagoon spans the entire Florida East Coast, uh, almost uh, 150 miles up and down from uh, Cape Canaveral, north of Cape Canaveral down to uh, almost to Palm Beach. And it's a really extensive waterway. It's widely considered to be one of the most diverse estuaries in the United States. We know there's thousands and thousands of plant and animal species, lots of fish, a lot of ma uh, manatees we see here, especially in the winter months. It's a really amazing waterway, but it's been challenged over the years by um, human development and a lot of environmental pressures. We have started to see a lot of algal blooms. These pictures show you this green slime. This is this is cyanobacteria or blue-green water um, becoming extremely abundant in the water column. We call these algal blooms and they can be harmful. They can cause uh, fish kills and other um, environmental uh, problems. This is a different kind of algal bloom called a brown tide, which we've been seeing in the, in the waterways for the last uh, five or 10 years. Um, and that's unfortunately is a fish kill in this picture. These are dying. In a brown tide, what happens is the algal cells that are growing in the water get so dense that um, the oxygen levels get depleted and that's what kills the fish in this particular bloom. There are some algal blooms that 
produce toxins as well, which can kill organisms. But algal, algae are good. I don't want to uh, give them a bad reputation. Uh, they're an important part of our food chain. And you can see a nice diverse algal community called phyto, you know, we call them phytoplankton because they are plants and they live in the plankton. Um, they're naturally grazed by zooplankton as well as a lot of other organisms. Um, we've been studying how some of these different kinds of animals, invertebrates that we call filter feeders because they feed on those particulate algae and, and zooplankton in the water, how those can help <coughs> mitigate or prevent some of these algal blooms. This slide shows you everything from tunicates or ascidians to, to barnacles, which will feed on particles, bryozoans, oysters, bivalve sponges, all of these are filter feeders and play a really important role in the environment. Especially important are some of the bivalves and they have a great reputation for being filter feeders and cleaning up the water. They take, they can filter, um, I think it's often said that an oyster can filter water uh, like uh, as almost as much as a swimming pool in a day or so. So they can really pump a lot of water through and help clean out particles. So made uh, studying their role in, um, in, in as filter feeders and mitigating algal blooms has made me a big, big fan of um, oyster restoration and other bivalve restoration projects because they really have an important role to play. Not only do we like them because they're commercially harvested, right? They're a food for a lot, a lot of people enjoy eating oysters and other bivalves, but they're really important in the ecosystem. Here's some experiments we were doing, um, pumping up, actually pumping up the water from, uh, we, we did this on a dock at Cocoa Beach. We pumped up the water from a brown tide bloom and actually tested uh, how the animals fed in these little individual chambers. Here's a closer look, with, here's the water pumping through these chambers. And here you can see we've got a bunch of clams. We were doing all this stuff uh, down in Co up in Cocoa Beach. It was a very fun project, but really got us to understand very carefully how all these animals are um, filtering out uh, particles from the water, and especially these algal particles. So here we did some work on this, on this brown tide, which happened to occur during the time we were doing all this, uh, all this work. And this is, this is notable, right? These are the brown tide, which is uh, a brown, an alga called Aria umbra is at millions of cells per milliliter of water. So that's less than a teaspoon. So you can just imagine how dense these cells can become. Again, uh, bivalves play a really important role here. And uh, I think are re it's really important for us to recognize how um, things like bivalves and coral reefs and other uh, foundation species are, are so important to these habitats. So I also have a, a, a picture of our wonderful aquarium. This is where Laura and uh, Jashira, our other educator on the call today, are, um, do a lot of their work and have worked. And uh, this is in partnership with St. Lucie County. And I think in some of our next presentations, we'll be hearing a, a, lot, a little bit about, a little bit more about the uh, aquarium and, and model it, doing these ecosystem models like they have in there, like this wonderful coral reef tank. Uh, that you see in this picture. And so it's been really fun to <clears throat> be involved in some of the uh, education and outreach efforts at the Smithsonian Marine Station as well, especially through the aquarium, but through uh, other activities like we're doing today with this presentation. Oh, and just one last slide, and that's to, I focused on mentors a lot. Uh, but I also want to focus on how important uh, teamwork and uh, partnerships are in doing science, marine science, of course, but just about any kind of science. And these are members up here on the right of my, kind of my current research group, or at least what it looked like about a year ago. But here's a bunch of us <clears throat> working together on the dock at Terry Bow Key. These were all people working together with me and uh, one other scientist at the university <coughs> who's at the University of Delaware working on a project down there. Uh, and then a team that's been working on some of our coral disease work. So really, you know, none of this work that I talked about is done by just me. 
and especially uh, if you're scuba diving, you always need a buddy. So there's at least two people involved, but uh, in many cases, it's a, a, a team effort and uh, lots of people at different stages of their careers have been able to participate with us and that's been really, really fun. Dr. Paul, thank you so much for speaking to us today and telling us a little bit more about your background and all the things that you, all the amazing experiences that you've had. Um, I know for me personally, I love Nudebrink, so hearing about your work with them was really, really exciting. We are going to just flip it over and um, take some questions from the audience. We've had a few really good ones. Um, so without further ado, let's get into some of the questions. Jayla has asked us, have there been similar harmful algal blooms instances in the Caribbean and especially in Belize? Uh, yes, so let's see, I'm just trying to figure out how to get out of this screen share. But I got it for you. Got it. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Uh, yes, we've seen a couple cases of algal blooms. So uh, some of the, I've shown you sort of two different types of algal blooms in my pictures today. Some of those uh, blue green algae that look like hair that were on the bottom. So we've been studying those down in Belize and in the uh, summer months they become very uh, common on the reefs and abundant sometimes and can cause some harm. Sometimes they'll overgrow as I showed you uh, sea fans or soft corals and occasionally even hard corals. So we've been looking at how some of those compounds that they produce can actually can inhibit the settlement of the larvae like I showed you. So the larvae of corals are very, well and most animals, are very particular. I showed you one example of how they use chemical signals uh, for that little nudibranch. And, uh, and so um, if the reef doesn't smell right, they often won't settle. And we found that some of these cyanobacteria um, inhibit the settlement. So that's one example of some of the work we've been doing. We've also been uh, looking at uh, planktonic blooms. And we had one situation where that happened in Belize and uh, it actually caused some sponge kills. And to this day, we don't even know what the algal bloom was. So sometimes studying these can be pretty challenging, but we kind of keep at it because it's a really, uh, really interesting uh, subject in my, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree, especially as our oceans continue changing. We have time, we have room for, I think, one more question, and I think it's a really good one. So I'd like to ask it to you before we end our session today. Um, does it ever seem like marine, this question comes from Michelle in Maryland, so thank you, Michelle. Does it ever seem like marine biology is depicted being all about whales and big animals? It's pretty cool that there's so much still to be explored. What are some parts of marine biology that you think could be areas of research in the future? Well, there are plenty, of course. Uh, we've done some work with uh, looking at some of the, you know, I talked about algal blooms and they're certainly, a, 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 especially the blue-green algae are somewhat a consequence of uh, warming temperatures in our oceans. Uh, they, that, the cyanobacteria really like warmer temperatures, so they helps them grow a lot faster and better. So that's, that's one problem. There's certainly a lot, a lot to be studied about how our seas are changing. Of course, the what we call the charismatic megafauna, the turtles and dolphins and whales and everything get a lot of attention. And of course, um, you know, every every time I'm a marine biologist, every time I go out on the water and see uh, turtles or dolphins or whales, I get excited too. So I think we all share that passion. But uh, clearly, it's important to start, as I showed you, at the bottom of the food chain with the algae and other things. There, uh, extremely important. Without them, those. Uh, those charismatic megafauna wouldn't be there. So uh, I think there's a lot to be studied at, at, at just about every level um, from, from the, you know, from the algae all the way up to through all, all the higher organisms as well. And I mean, microbes, didn't even mention those, right? But they're getting a lot of attention in our oceans as well. So even the things you can't see are extremely important. So lots of room for opportunity. All of our young budding science ne scientists need to get out there and start uh, start categorizing it. Oh, there's there's so much to be done. It's really um, it's an exciting field. And as a as a researcher, almost every time you 
uh, find the answer to something, you've opened up about two or three more questions. So uh, there's, there's always uh, room to explore and, and learn more. Dr. Paul, thank you so, so much for your time today. And thank you to everyone watching and for joining us and for your incredibly great questions. Um, before we go, are there fi any final things that you wanted to share with the audience or to young scientists who are thinking about pursuing marine biology as a career? Well, I say uh, it kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning, you know, get involved, give it a try. There's lots of opportunities. Sometimes there's clubs at your school to get involved in, in science or, or even marine science. Um, you know, get involved in, in uh, community programs, go to your local uh, aquarias or, or zoos or whatever might be available to you and where you live and learn all you can and uh, get involved in research if you can. Uh, a lot of, I know a lot of students start off with science fair projects and other things, but uh, if you get a chance to even volunteer and, uh, and give it a try and see if you like it. Awesome. Great advice. If you live locally to Fort Pierce, Florida, um, you can always volunteer with us at the Smithsonian Marine Station or at the Ecosystems Exhibit. Absolutely. Okay, everyone. Thanks again so much for joining us. This was our first ever marine conversation in our Career Dive series. If you enjoyed this program, please join us again next week on Thursday at 10 a.m. Um, we're going to have a special edition on microplastics in honor of World Oceans Day, which is June 8th. You can find the registration links for our live stream on the Facebook page. We're going to be sharing the links every Monday with you, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, just here is going to be sharing a link in the chat box for you today, so you can double check there for next week. But other than that, thank you again so much, Dr. Paul, for your time and for being our first ever interviewee with the Smithsonian Marine Station. Um, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Laura, for hosting. It, seemed, uh, it was a great program, great questions. And you know, thanks to all the audience that participated. They had some great questions as well. So really, really thank you. All right, everybody, that's it from us. We'll see you next week.